So today we are presenting this case from Department of Pediatrics and Department of Pathology. Patient details are patient AM, M, 15 year old adolescent boy, residence, resident of Jaisalmer, Rajasthan, date of admission being 24th of August and date of discharge is 26th of April. admitted for a short admission for workup. Duration of hospital stay was just three days. Child has presented to our OPD with breathing difficulty of five years, weakness, which is which was proximal predominant for four years, and progressive wasting of all the extremities over three years. Child was well till 10, 10 years of age. He was absolutely asymptomatic. And from last five years, the symptoms have started, which has progressed till now. Started with complaints of easy fatigability, which was initially on exertion. And due to that, child has stopped his uh, outside outdoor activities and slowly even all the fast activities, walking, climbing stairs, and he is fa starting facing difficulties in routine day-to-day -day activities when he presented to us. And from uh, parents also notice that child is not getting up from squatting position once he is seated and he has faced a lot of difficulties. Difficulty in climbing stairs and difficulty in lifting heavy objects, especially overhead uh, activities. This was accompanied, these symptoms were accompanied by progressive wasting of limbs and facial muscles. This was the symptomatology the child presented with, and this has uh, progressed over five years. Hist coming to history of presenting illness, there was no history of diurnal variation in weakness of limbs, drooping of eyelids, tremulousness of hands, double vision or blurry vision. So there was no history of suggestive of any drooping of eyelids, tremulousness of hands, double vision or blurry vision, no history of slipping of slippers while walking, no history of difficulty in buttoning, unbuttoning, writing, no history of difficulty in combing hair, no history of difficulty in turning on bed from side to side, no history suggestive of any cranial nerve deficits, no history of any tingling sensation, numbness, inability to differentiate hotness or coldness of things. No history of any abnormal twisting movements suggestive of dystonias or any extrapyramidal movements. No history suggestive of any incoordination, swaying, jerky eye movements. No bladder bowel complaints. No history of bed sores, contractures. No history of trauma. No history of chest pain and palpitations. Past history uh, before uh, 10 years of age, there was nothing significant and there was no history of any hospitalization also. Antenatal. History uneventful, birth history was not con contributory to the illness, it was absolutely normal. And developmental history was appropriate for age. Coming to family history, which gave us a, the first clue child was born out of a non consanguineous marriage, and there was an elder sibling. A female sibling, which which was uh, she she was 18 year old, 18 year expired at 18 years. History of similar illness, similar kind of illness, progressive weakness, easy fatigability, and generalized wasting since seven years of age. Her weakness started at seven years, the illness, and it has progressed till 18 years, and child finally succumbed. So she expired at 18 years of age with uh, reported to have a sudden onset breathlessness at that time. This was the photograph of the child, which we could arrange uh, after permission from parents. The, the child who was expired. Vitals uh, of this index child that were essentially normal. And in anthropometry, severe, severe thinness with preserved stature was noted. The height was um, like it was normal, up normal standards. But severe uh, thinning was noted. BMI was just 9.6. In head to toe examination, child was have uh, appeared to have this myopathic faces, tall, elongated, visible, severe wasting, no particular group of muscles atrophied or hypertrophied was noted, no kyphosis, scoliosis, no contractures, no pallor, ictrosinosis, clubbing, pedal edema, lymphadenopathy. Systemic examination, higher mental functions were essentially normal. Tenon of examination was also normal. Motor examination revealed mild weddling, which was very subtle, and it is exaggerated on when child was asked to walk on toes. Bulk, as bulk examination has revealed generalized thinning, generalized wasting. Tone has decreased in all four limbs, 
and there was no uh, abnormalities in superficial reflexes and there was no primitive reflexes or clonus. DTRs were elicitable and biceps, triceps, supinator, knee was 2 plus and ankle was 1 plus. So all DTRs were elicited. Power, in power examination, there was weakness noted in almost all the muscle groups except the grip of the child. And uh, weakness was not significant, significant enough, like it was not, uh, the child is not able to uh, do anti-gravity movements and against resistance, but there was weakness noted. It was most of the joints, it was four, four by five, but in the lower limbs at the hip girdle, there was uh, weakness was relatively more, which was noted to have uh, almost three by five power at hip flexion extension and hip adduction also. Rest of the joints, the power was decreased and it was 4 by 5. Power sign, uh, the historically the child, uh, the parents don't give the sign, the history of any go goer sign being present and currently the child could not get up once he is made to sit. So this was not noted. No extra pyramidal movements. Sensory system examination was essentially normal. Cerebellum, spine and cranium examination was normal too. Examination findings, so in examination, we can see that there was no specific muscle group hypertrophy or selective atrophy, which has been noted. There was no cough hypertrophy. So when we talk about hypertrophy or atrophy, we should also know what a specific hypertrophy looks like. So we can see this is classical muscular, like calf hypertrophy, which we see in muscular dystrophies. The prototype example is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So this is a selective group hypertrophy of the calf muscles. Also, this the second photo is showing brachioradialis hypertrophy. We can see the prominent brachioradialis in a wasted child. And this is hypertrophy of infraspinatus and central fibers of deltoid and infromedial attachment of infraspinatus muscle giving rise to valley sign. So these are the classical signs which we note in muscular dystrophies, especially Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which was absent in this child. So coming to gait examination, you can see there was mild wedling. There was, which is very subtle, which is exaggerated on that toe walking. And once he is made to sit, he cannot get up. He just simply refuses. Simply refuses. He cannot even attempt. So he needs support. There, on back examination, there was no winging of scapula. There was mild facial weakness noted. Especially when we are, he is asked to blow air from the first lips. There was no polymini myoclonus. Polymini myoclonus is a finding which we get in anterior horn cell involvement, which reveals, which uh, we see the, in form of fasciculations or tra fine tremors, which is which occurs in extended hands. So this is a finding which help us often in our OPDs and in our wards to localize it to anterior horn cell and there was no tongue fasciculations too. So what they look like, like scapular winging in a child. So you can see here that clearly this first photograph, this is the classical scapular winging when you ask the child to push on the wall. The, you can see the scapula being coming to close to each other and they become predominant. And the, these are the two videos which, which you see carefully. These two shows Gower signs, modified Gower sign, but both of the children has a different type of Gower sign if you note. The boy stands after taking his legs back and in extent, and like he uses his extensors, and the girl uses to uses her abductors, hip abductors to stand. So, 
okay so this type of examination when we do it it helps us in localizing clinically so like type of gore sign this type of gore sign when the child uses his abductors her, her abductors to stand it can localize that that this type of gore sign is not present in duchenne muscular dystrophy it is present in other muscular dystrophies like lgmds and this is the classical gore sign which is present in duchenne muscular dystrophy where abductors are relatively more weak than the extensors so he cannot stand on the ab abductors and fasciculations which we have seen and uh, which we have which was not noticed classically looks like this and this is a polymini myoclonus you can see the fine fasciculations happening in the fingers in cvs examination we have uh, got another clue other than the other, after the neuromuscular examination that the child had a grade 2 ejection systolic murmur which was best heard in the mitral area respiratory system not, nothing contributory there was mild bilateral normal vesicular breath sounds no added sounds and per abdomen there was no organomegaly so where to localize this illness principles so we will learn briefly so when we deal with any child with weakness how do we localize so we know all central nervous system as well peripheral nervous system can cause weakness but we can fairly get an idea by this child's history that we can localize this child to lower motor neuron kind of weakness the lower motor neuron neuron consists of and from anterior horn cells motor unit then it will go to uh, neuromuscular junction uh, and then uh, muscle so this constitutes the motor unit so easily we can rule out it is not umn there was so many markers hypotonia hyporeflexia or areflexia and abdominal reflex sensor present then there was proximal predominant weakness there was uh, uh, there was uh, facial muscle weakness there was waddling gait so there are so many things so anterior horn cells classical findings are normal alertness generalized weakness absent reflexes fasciculations mute or flexor plantar and prototype diseases are spinal muscular atrophy poliomyelitis and motor neuron disease peripheral now hypotonia they present with hypotonia distal weakness symmetric weakness absent dtrs or reduced dtrs motor and sensory involvement and sometimes they can be accompanied by pain prototype diseases are charcot marie tooth disease hereditary sensory autonomic neuropathy gbs in acquired causes and giant axonal neuropathy neuromuscular junction classical features are extraocular muscle weakness ptosis bulbar involvement pure motor type, pure motor type of weakness proximal and distal muscles are equally affected this weakness is fatigable and fluctuate it has a fluctuating nature normal dtrs and flexor plantar prototype diseases are myasthenia gravis congenital myasthenic syndromes and botulism and muscle which can present as myopathy or muscular dystrophy has classical features of proximal girdle weakness specific muscle hypertrophy or atrophy can be there in muscular dystrophies normal or reduced dtrs can be there and flexor plantars prototype diseases are congenital myopathies inflammatory myopathies congenital muscular dystrophies dmd and lgmds to summarize we can see we can fairly localize this child to the muscle as the strength was low dtrs were decreased or you can say it as they are normal but they can they can be there babinski was not there primitive reflexes was not there no fasciculations which were noted and muscle was muscle mass was decreased generalized so how do we recognize this pattern when we examine this child so we see the weakness pattern we see which is more proximal weakness is more or distal weakness is more are face and eyes affected so based on this uh, examination findings we try to localize whenever we get a child with a neuromuscular weakness so we can see this their face fa facial muscles are involved the arms and legs are equally affected so we are uh, localizing this child to muscle or a anterior horn cell involvement or a mixed involvement so coming to our patient 
in anterior horn cell there was generalized weakness absent reflexes and fasciculations so all these three was not there as facial muscles only face was affected and the rest of the facial like you know that is mild, only mild weakness which can be ex easily explained by the atrophy of the facial muscles now hypotonia was there but other findings were missing distal weakness absent dtrs motor sensory involvement pain neuromuscular junction there was no bulbar involvement it was it was pure motor but there was no extraocular muscle involvement no ptosis proximal and distal weakness it was not so it was proximal predominant and there was no fluctuation there was no diurnal variation and to muscle we could localize to all almost all the points proximal girdle weakness was there pure motor there was wasting there was uh, normal or reduced dtrs muscle group hypertrophy is a finding which we get in uh, selecting muscle group hypertrophy is a finding which you get in muscular dystrophies so not all muscle diseases have hypertrophy or atrophy if you find hypertrophy or atrophy in a patient with muscle localization suspect a dystrophic cause so further delineating the or child clinically proximal weakness so we know that the non myopathic causes are ruled out myopathic we are not dealing with any acquired cause long history progressive history relentless history so all acquired causes have would have progressed by now or made the child uh, like you know de debilitated and there was a positive family history so acquired causes is not possible in this child Gen genetic causes backers or duchenne muscular dystrophy limb girdle muscular dystrophies are out because we are not dealing with dystrophies in this in our child possible remaining causes it can be a congenital myopathy but odd point is the onset being 7 to 7 after 7 years and 10 years mitochondrial odd point is the there was no fluctuation no other systems affected generally mitochondrial have systemic involvement metabolic causes were there in our dd and acid maltase deficiency which is also included in the metabolic causes why not muscular dystrophy so muscular dystrophies we can easily rule out by clinical examination they always have a pattern they have a pattern so they have a limb girdle pattern they have a selective group of muscles affected in every type of muscular dystrophy so we clinically can delineate which muscle disease we are dealing whenever we are dealing with muscular dystrophy so uh, uh, only congenital muscular dystrophy which can have generalized involvement was in our dd but uh, that is also odd seeing at the history as the onset was not at early it was after 7 to 10 years of normalcy so this was not in our that that it is possible theoretically but we have not kept this as the our front possibility so case analysis with possible differentials to so juvenile onset possible posterior family history element type weakness and it is localized to localizing to muscles so we are dealing with some genetic myopathies differentials we kept are metabolic glycogen or lipid storage mitochondrial rare presentation congenital myopathies or congenital muscular dystrophy very rarely or or fourth possibility you can say so we have investigated the child we have done a ck nac which has revealed uh, creatine kinase which has revealed a value of 2347 which is fairly raised but not to the tune of muscular dystrophies most of the muscular dystrophies have values uh, around 5000 more than 5000 cardiac evaluation so cardiac evaluation again so ecg again gave us a clue there was short pr interval with left axis deviation and left bundle branch block and left ventricular hypertrophy and echocardiography concentric left ventricular hypertrophy was detected grade 3 left ventricular diastolic dysfunction was also noted so we have with this background we have gone ahead with two uh, uh, investigations which will possibly lead us to diagnosis a muscle biopsy was done and it was sent for histopathological examination and uh, it genetics of the child was sent with the possibility of the uh, uh, above differentials which we kept which we kept in the previous slide so with this this was the ecg of the child showing short pr interval with left axis deviation and left bundle branch block and left ventricular hypertrophy so with this i will invite uh, dr divya who is the
consultant in pathology department for further taking us to the diagnosis. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. So we'll be discussing uh, what we found in the muscle biopsy of this case and how uh, it helped us in the diagnosis. Before I move on to what all pathology we can see in the muscle biopsy, let me just take you quickly through uh, what a normal or a relatively normal muscle biopsy looks like. So this is one of the cases where we had uh, no significant pathological changes on light microscopic examination of the muscle biopsy. And what you see here are a, a beautiful transverse cut. So remember that it is important to take a transverse cut in a muscle biopsy because you want to compare the fiber size and shape and you want to look at atrophy, hypertrophy and so on and so forth. So uh, that is what we try to achieve when we orient the muscle biopsy and we try to cut it in a cryostat. So here in this muscle biopsy, you see these relatively polygonal shaped uh, muscle fibers, which are almost equal in size. They have a similar shape. Uh, most of the nuclei are located peripherally. You see these tiny blue dots located at the periphery of each muscle fiber. And what you see here is the an endomycial connective tissue. So this thin white line, which you see in between each individual muscle fiber is the endomycial connective tissue. And in a relatively normal muscle, what you'll find is very teeny amount of this connective tissue. No fibrosis, no fat is trying to infiltrate here. You can see a few endomycial blood vessels. What we try to see in the blood vessels is any amyloid, vasculitis, any perivascular inflammation, any endothelial cell damage, and so on and so forth. So with this in mind, uh, we try to classify the muscle uh, fibers into type 1 and type 2, broadly speaking. The type 2 are the fast fibers, type 1 are the slow fibers. And the major way that we try to differentiate them on a biopsy are by using these histochemical stains, most of which the commonly used ones are NADHTR, cytochrome oxidase, also known as COX, and succinate dehydrogenase, also known as SDH. All the three enzymes have a higher activity in type 1 fibers. And in type 1 fibers, you have a higher amount of fat as compared to glycogen, which is actually higher in type 2 fibers. So for glycogen, you can do a stain which is known as PAS or paraiodic acid shift. And for lipid, we do stains like oil red O and Sudan black B. The importance of uh, doing a of examining a fresh muscle biopsy is actually lying here because these histochemical stains or these enzyme activities are not, uh, you cannot see them once you have processed the biopsy in formalin. So in a formalin fixed tissue, we cannot tell you what the muscle, fi muscle fiber types are. Is it a type 1 fiber or a type 2 fiber? And uh, you cannot do lipid stains because fat actually gets dissolved on formalin processing. Uh, so as I said, NADH stain gets highlights the type 1 fibers darker and the type 2 ones are lighter. When you look at a PA stain, you will see again a differential staining between type 1 and type 2 fibers. And most of the PAS positive material in any normal muscle is glycogen. The proof of that being that when you pre-treat the slide with diastase, which is an enzyme which di uh, digests the glycogen, all the glycogen vanishes away after staining the slide with PAS. Before you, before that, you have to pre-treat with diastase. So you can see that all the glycogen has digested and only the sarcolemma, the uh, membrane of the muscle fiber gets stained with PAS. Oil red o again shows differential staining between the type 1 and type 2 fibers. It is, is seen as uniformly distributed small tiny granules which are present throughout the muscle fiber which are higher in type 1 fibers and a few granules can be seen in type 2 fibers. Coming to the findings of the index case, so I hope you can appreciate the abnormality here much better now that you have an idea of what a normal muscle looks like. This is a relatively preserved fiber and what you see in the rest of the fibers is that they are markedly enlarged. Some of them are this kind of teeny tiny fibers. So I'd say that there is a marked variation in fiber size and shape. Now, why are these fibers enlarged is very nicely visible here. You see that there are multiple vacuoles which are filling up the fiber and making it large. And these vacuoles, if you try and find out, are predominantly located in a subsarcolemmal location. That is, this is the sarcolemma or the cytoplasmic membrane of any muscle fiber. And you see that in the subsarcolemmal location, these uh, vacuoles are predominant, though in some fibers they are kind of present all throughout. Again, you see some uh, vacuoles which are present throughout, some vacuoles which are pushing the rest of the cytoplasm to the periphery and uh, a higher power view of the same. And in some of the fibers, the remaining sarcoplasm was so little that most of the fiber was actually replaced by these huge vacuoles. Uh, 
like you can see here you can just see a few nuclei which are remnant and the rest of the fiber is just formed by these kind of vacuoles there was an occasional fiber which was showing a central nucleus but the evidence of regeneration was not very evident in this biopsy and there were no significant atrophic or hypertrophic fibers a pa stain highlighted a lot of glycogen deposits which were pas positive in all these dilate in all these enlarged fibers again you can see here there were most of these deposits were granular and at places there were some flocculent deposits on pas stain as you can see here so uh, pas stains a lot of materials it uh, stains a lot of uh, carbohydrates but the way to prove that what was staining positive on pas was actually glycogen is to do a pas diastase stain like i highlighted earlier and on diastase stain all the deposits vanished and we have a, had a uh, clear looking biopsy with just these vacuoles visible and no pas positive material which was diastase resistant all of the material was diastase sensitive highlighting that it was actually glycogen then we did an oil red o stain so when you're looking at such a muscle biopsy which is filled with vacuoles you're looking at a storage disorder and the storage disorders that we commonly come across and were kept in clinical differentials in this case was either a glycogen storage disorder or a lipid storage disorder so we've already uh, we already saw some material which was glycogen and then to rule out that it was not actually a pure lipid storage disorder we did oil red o and sudan black b stains so you see that most of the muscle fibers do not have any oil red o positive granules but there were some fibers which did show a few oil red o positive granules uh, like these three fibers or this one actually elongated fiber here on sudan black b also there was presence of some blue black sudan black b positive granules which were mostly located again in a sub sarcolemmal location however most of the vacuolated fibers did not show any Uh, oil red o on e sudan black b or oil red o positive granules to indicate a possibility of a lipid storage disorder again a few more images to show you the sudan black b positive granules which were uh, present in a few fibers so with that in mind we came to the uh, diagnosis that we are actually dealing with the glycogen storage disorder and how we ruled out the other clinical differentials i'll just discuss briefly so this is the classical picture that we see in a mitochondrial myopathy in a mitochondrial disease we have this something known as sub sarcolemmal accentuation of basophilia so the abnormal mitochondria accumulate at the periphery of any fiber you can see them on hne sections and they are highlighted beautifully on modified gomori trichome stain to uh, become what we classically call as red ragged fiber so this is the red or magenta appearance that you see on modified gomori trichrome which gives them the name of red ragged fibers Another finding that you can find in mitochondrial myopathies is the presence of Cox deficient fiber. So cytochrome oxidase is a mitochondrial enzyme which is absent in these disorders, and you can see that in the form of Cox deficient fibers when you do a Cox SDH histochemical stain. It helps to remember that not all mitochondrial myopathies will look as beautiful as the images that you just saw before this, and a lot of mitochondrial myopathies will show you a normal looking muscle. you may be lucky you may find cox deficient fibers you may find red ragged fibers but a normal muscle biopsy does not rule out the possibility that you are dealing with a mitochondrial myopathy just a very uh, simplified version of what you can see in congenital myopathy so this is a table from robins which tells you the basic types of congenital myopathy <laughs> central core disease nimelin myopathy nuclear <laughs> myopathy and congenital fiber type distribution This is what a central uh, central myopathy looks like. You have these cores which can be seen on HNE stain, and you have these uh, central, slightly different staining cores which are best highlighted on NADH because in NADH they lack any NADH activity. On PAS, they will again be seen beautifully. They will have a paler staining, and they will have a thin peripheral rim which can be seen. these are the nimelin rods again on mgd stain you will see some sub sarcolemmal rod like material which is there a central nuclear myopathy stands true to its name because it shows you these centrally placed huge nuclei within almost every muscle fiber on a transverse section and you will see a chain of nuclei on a longitudinal section nadh also shows you these typical central nuclei and of congenital fiber type disproportion will show you a lot of atrophy a lot of hypertrophy and you can decide which fibers are getting atrophied congenital uh, fiber type atrophy usually has a predominance of type 1 fibers which get atrophied but none of that was present in our biopsy it was not a dystrophy uh, which was a very low clinical possibility however in a dystrophy you see the pseudo hypertrophy so the pseudo hypertrophy is actually because most of the muscle fibers are atrophied they are useless now 
but the muscle fiber gets replaced by a lot of fat and a lot of fibrosis which gives the muscle a pseudo hypertrophied appearance on clinical examination so we knew that we were dealing with a glycogen storage disorder but the list of glycogen storage disorders is huge and these are some of the common differentials that we see on biopsy usually muscle biopsy is considered a relatively non specific uh, diagnostic modality for glycogen storage disorders and this is the reason why because there's a lot of overlap between different disorders we knew that it was not a type 15 or a type 0 glycogen storage disease because these are the diseases which are associated with glycogen depletion in muscle but ours was showing excess of glycogen our material was diastase sensitive so that helped us to put these phosphofructokinase and phosphorylase kinase deficiencies lower down because they are associated with the presence of diastase resistant polyglucosan bodies none of which were appreciable in our biopsy and then came the major players which were the type 2 3 4 and 5 glycogen storage disorders all of which can show you vascular change in the muscle with ps positive subsarcoemal deposits some of them like anderson disease may show you some fiber some material which is resistant to digestion which was not there in our case we did not have any significant regenerating fibers putting mcardles lower down but remember that none of these are very specific uh, findings in any glycogen storage disorder and there is a huge overlap so this is what a typical type 0 and type 15 biopsy would look like there would be no deposits on pas stain and there's complete glycogen depletion pompe's disease looks somewhat like this where you have a lot of glycogen storage vacuoles which can be present subsarcoemally and can displace the cytoplasm to the periphery a similar overlapping picture is seen in type 3 glycogenosis type 4 glycogenosis will also show you a similar picture but is usually associated with the presence of these diastase resistant crystalloids which are birefringent on polarized microscopy a finding which was absent in our case and again type 5 glycogenosis or mcardles will also show you sub sub subsarcoemal glycogen vacuoles so again uh, you are dealing with a glycogen storage disorder you have a, you have multiple differentials but uh, something there is something that separates the type 2 glycogen storage or pompe's disease from rest of the glycogen storage disorders and that is the fact that the glycogen build up which happens in pompe's disease actually happens inside the lysosome so it is this lysosomal enlargement and dysfunction which results in defective acidification within these lysosomes which damages the muscle further in pompe's disease and hence there is a typical value of muscle biopsy in late onset Uh, pompe's disease because you will have a lot of lysosomes and auto lysosomes which are loaded with lipopigments which are actually formed by lipofusion which are a hallmark of late onset pompe disease in a skeletal muscle biopsy something that separates the pompe's disease from rest of the gsts as i have discussed is the fact that these diseases were originally classified as glycogen storage disorders but because of the subsequent recognition that it is the accumulation of glycogen within the lysosomes which helps characterize these disorders as both a glycogen storage and a lysosomal storage disorder so the accumulation of this autophagic debris which results from a dysfunction of lysosomes is a well recognized phenomenon now in pompe's disease and in other lysosome storage disorders and how do you characterize or identify these inclusions the most specific test for doing that is that these inclusions stain positive for sudan black b and oil red o they show you auto fluorescence when you examine them to fluorescent uh, light microscopic examination and this auto fluorescence you can see on an unstained slide but when you look for fluorescence on a sudan black b stained slide this fluorescence will vanish away because this auto fluorescence is quenched by sudan black b staining so we set out to demonstrate the same on our case we did find some oil red o positive and some sudan black b positive granules as i had highlighted earlier and when i went out to look at these in a fluorescent uh, light microscopic examination they were clearly auto fluorescent so they had this yellow orange kind of auto fluorescence that you see here and again there is a slight predisposition of this fluorescence fluorescent granules towards the subsarcoemal location again a few fibers which show you this subsarcoemal granules which are auto fluorescent ignore these big bright lights these are actually dirt particles which are also auto fluorescent but you have to look at these kind of muscle fibers which are showing you auto fluorescent granules within them and this is a sudan black b stained slide which on fluorescent microscopy did not show any granules so their auto fluorescence was quenched on sudan black b hence demonstrating that these were actually accumulated lipopigments within the lysosomes so you can still see these huge vacuolated muscle fibers being Uh, which are kind of shining here 
Again, another slide to show you the same. And again, I hope you can appreciate these huge vacuolated fibers, which do not show you any autofluorescent granules. So this led us to conclude that the glycogen storage disorder that we are dealing with actually has features consistent with late onset Pompeii disease. Uh, just a brief, if you're looking to sample a muscle biopsy in an acute or subacute injury case, try to sample a severely affected muscle because that is the one which will show us most of the pathological changes. If you're dealing with a chronic injury, if you're dealing with a dystrophy or if you're dealing with a very chronic uh, um, muscle weakness, try to biopsy a muscle which is still showing you muscle weakness. Don't biopsy a muscle which is now completely atrophied because a completely atrophied muscle will show us predominantly fat and fibrosis and only a few viable muscle fibers which will not help us go to a final diagnosis. The way that we process a muscle biopsy is that we use a liquid nitrogen container. We take isopentane in a small container. We lower down this isopentane into the liquid nitrogen. The liquid nitrogen is at a temperature of minus 180 degrees. This lowering down, making sure that no liquid nitrogen should enter this container. Once you lower down the isopentane container into the liquid nitrogen container, the isopentane freezes into a solid. And that is when you put the muscle biopsy. Remember to orient the muscle biopsy before you put it in the isopentane container. You orient it in a way to get the maximum transverse cuts because that is what is most helpful in examining the biopsy. Uh, this helps in snap freezing the biopsy, which can then be embedded into the OCT or the optimum cooling temperature medium and cut into a uh, three to four micron sections in a cryostat. Now, why do you have to send a, a fresh muscle biopsy? Why can't you just dip it in formalin like you do for all your other biopsies? The reason lies in the histochemical stains like NADH, COX, and STH that we discussed earlier. These histochemical stains serve as a link between morphology and biochemistry of the tissue. So if you put the biopsy in formalin and it goes through the whole processing to become a paraffin embedded tissue, the, his, the activity of these enzymes is lost. And so there's no way to demonstrate if you're looking at type 1 fibers or type 2 fibers, the inclusions of an inclusion body myositis, the red ragged fibers of a mitochondrial myopathy are all dissolved on for, formalin fixed paraffin embedded sections. So they are practically useless for trying to diagnose these disorders. And uh, you can identify the fiber types with these histochemical stains. You can demonstrate the activity of particular enzymes. And remember that lipid also gets dissolved with formalin uh, fixed processing. So demonstrating lipid is also not possible in formalin fixed sections. The way to uh, send a muscle biopsy to the lab would be to take a clean gauze piece, wet it in a little bit of normal saline, squeeze out all the liquid that there is in the gauze so that you have a just damp or moist gauze piece with no liquid droplets inside. And then you go ahead, put your fresh muscle biopsy in it, put that, wrap it up in the gauze piece, put it in a clean container and bring it to the lab as soon as possible for processing. Uh, I will now uh, request Dr. Lokesh to continue with the further management and uh, details of this case. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Divya, for the uh, beautiful slides and excellent teachings. Uh, so the exome sequencing which we have sent, we also received this report suggesting the, the validating the findings which we got in the muscle biopsy. The child was showing positive mutation, which was pathogenic for GSD2, which is consistent with the late onset Pompe's disease. So our final diagnosis for this case was late onset glycogen storage disorder type 2 with grade 3 left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. So come, just briefly, we will learn about this disease. So the, also known as acid maltase deficiency, GSD type 2. It is inherited as autosomal recessive pattern. It can uh, occur due to partial or total deficiency. Total deficiencies present in infantile age group and they invariably have cardiac involvement, but cardiac involvement in partial deficiencies like late onset pompage is very, very rare. So that is the uh, intriguing point in this case, because usually late onset pompage disease will not have cardiac involvement. Combined prevalence, <clears throat> there was uh, of one in 40,000 and late onset disease, if you take in isolation, the, uh, this prevalence is one in 57,000. But problem with this disease is it is very rarely diagnosed because the proposed facilities like muscle biopsies, 
facilities like genetic testing are not available everywhere and uh, the clinical uh, um, masquerading of this particular entity is very um, notorious because it is a late onset variant of variant of pompous disease which mimics a muscular dystrophy or myopathy kind of illness it arise it, it starts around 7 to 10 years of age and it can start it can start first symptoms can be noticed around 20 years of age also so it can happen in adults also so nobody will think a genetically oriented like mediated disease will start so later so this is the problem with this with this particular disease late onset pompous disease in diagnosing so we in this in this uh, slide we have seen that uh, already seen that typically absent the activities are typically absent is infantile onset pompous disease and in late onset pompous disease there is some residual activity that is why they manifest later and that is why we should have thought when the child presented after some time after like the girl presented uh, onset of symptoms is around seven years and the boys onset of symptoms around 10 years so there was some residual activity from which they are they are doing their activities and once it is depleted the they have manifested so that should have taken us to a storage disorder to straight away in when we are, when we are thinking about the possibilities and cardiomyopathy as i said it was typically not present in late onset pompous disease although there are some cases of um, wpw syndrome were reported so coming to progression it is very rapid infantile onset pompous disease is fatal if it is not treated invariably fatal in first two years of life and late onset pompous disease it is uh, rate of progression is very very variable as i said it is slower than for the infantile onset form and we some of the individuals can present in adulthood so diagnosis and treatment so non-specific things are there like emg which will reveal myopathic pattern and we by clinical examination only we can know that this is muscle so there is we can avoid this testing it is as it is a painful testing if we are sure that we are dealing with some muscle pathology muscle biopsy which can show glycogen vacuoles but now we have learned that we can also see specific findings for this disease and many other diseases as depicted by uh, the beautiful slides previously specific findings are enzyme assays we can do and we can do targeted gene panels or exome sequencing treatment is a multidisciplinary uh, team uh, which is comprised which comprises of neurology neurology neurologist physiotherapist occupational therapist geneticist cardiologist pulmonologist and dietitian and a specific treatment for this particular condition is available it is and there is enzyme replacement therapy available l glucosidase alpha it is available from a longer time. In fact, it is the first first disease of one of the first disease storage disease where enzyme replacement therapy is, has been approved. But the problem is cost. So take home points from our case is pompous disease is a rare GSD due to deficiency of alpha glucosidase enzyme. Heterogeneity in presentation makes diagnosis very difficult. Multidisciplinary team required for management of pompous disease. Enzyme replacement therapy is available in India. However, cost is a limiting factor. Good clinical examination clenches, precises diag diagnosis, and we can order investigation. So where to use muscle biopsy if muscle biopsy facilities are available. So the problem is the limitation. Facilities of muscle biopsies are not available everywhere. So even if uh, someone do muscle biopsy, there are no uh, facilities or no expert to interpret that find those findings. So they the way forward for such patients when we diagnose neuromuscular cases, most of the people think that they are not treatable, but not, it is not entirely true. A um, lot of conditions have treatment now. And our own Nidan Kendra is working on uh, this. It is uh, coming under the uh, purview of genet our genetics team. So our Nidan Kendra has a lot uh, of diseases that like database is there. and. Separately, neuromuscular diseases are being listed. They have also started some basic genetic testing. And in future, we will be doing our clinical exome and advanced genetic testing for sure. And most important advantage of 
establishing these facilities at our center is antenatal diagnosis and counseling in my like if only myself has uh, sent some children uh, who have who have who, who have been diagnosed with these lethal conditions they are antenatal mothers been counseled by genetics team the gynecology team uh, team have did antenatal diagnosis for them so most of the, the so the most many deadly disease has been prevented so 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 far and they will be prevented so that is the primary aim of diagnosing such conditions especially this rare genetic conditions procure nidan kendra is also trying to procure costly medicines for rare disorders so one patient is of pompe's late onset pompe disease already receiving monthly enzyme therapy for pompe's disease and cost of which is almost 2 lakh per month so they we are providing it uh, trying to provide it for free and we are trying for this patient also and soon this uh, nidan kendra will be center of excellence and many such patients especially this late onset pompe's disease dmd there are some treatments available nowadays spinal muscular atrophy treatments are available nowadays so these costly treatments otherwise parent cannot afford this type of costly treatment but if we do uh, if this uh, nidan kendra becomes center of excellence this uh, this there is a hope that these children will get this treatment soon so this is the data which we have in our uh, genetics department and our nidan kendra of neuromuscular disorders so far so we have around four cases of congenital myopathies congenital muscular dystrophy six cases are there congenital there are three cases of congenital myasthenia we have around uh, seven cases of various limb girdle muscular dystrophies and we have pompe's disease all three late onset as i said all early onset ones dies before the diagnosis has been made so we have all th three late onset in our follow up congenital muscular dystrophy one case myotonia congenita there is uh, one child duchenne muscular dystrophy there are around 150 cases in our follow up spinal muscular atrophy type 3 we have around 20 cases which is again a difficult condition to diagnose which because it mimics a muscular muscular dystrophy kind of illness spinal muscular atrophy type 1 and 2 we have around 44 cases and charcot marie tooth disease we have around 12 cases so all these cases are genetically proven so with that i want to thank you and uh, all the clinical pictures and videos which we have shown are taken uh, uh, shown after consent from parents and caregivers so we want to acknowledge uh, we like to acknowledge professor poona mehlens ma'am for her uh, continued support professor dr uh, sudeep khera sir i'd like to thank dr purvi purohit specially for her timely help especially with this case she was very resourceful i would like to thank our technicians mrs minakshi ji and mr rukmudin uh, who have been very diligent in trying to learn the processing and they have been always available for the same and uh, we also want to thank cardiology team they are always available in their busy schedule to do echo ecg and interpret and management of these children so we uh, send these children neuromuscular these children because they are associated with many cardiac conditions especially duchenne muscular dystrophy so we usually send to their busy opds and they never disappoint they uh, always help genetics team because they are doing all this antenatal part and they are uh, doing for uh, arranging treatments so this uh, cannot be done without the help of genetics team and pediatric surgery team which With, with help of them we have started our muscle biopsy program so uh, thank you to them also and with that we want to end this uh, cpc for today we are well uh, all any suggestions or any queries are welcome thank you so good morning uh, i am dr kuldeep uh, uh, head of department pediatrics so very uh, nice presentation dr lokesh and dr devya uh, i would also like to say that uh, because this is a condition where there is a multidisciplinary approach is required because uh, the these patients are also having some problem with the sleep that is obstructive sleep apnea so they are also in, to improve the quality of life some additional uh, gadgets and some additional innovations are required for these patient so they become uh, more uh, 
ambulatory and have a better quality of life that also we need to think about because most of these disorders are incurable and everybody knows about it but we can improve our uh, care to this patient through multidisciplinary approach uh, yes, that sir. is all i would like to comment but uh, that's very uh, nice presentation morning uh, dr lokesh it was a wonderful presentation this is dr puna melens from pathology yes ma'am thank you uh, so i just want to ask whether you uh, looked into the peripheral blood smear uh, because sometimes as we know the peripheral blood lymphocytes can show these vacuoles which are pes positive and if the patient hasn't been initiated on treatment we can still look into that you know um we have said we have seen a peripheral smear but we yeah. will again we can again send this because yeah, we are because yeah we are still to start this treatment for yeah, this yeah because you know i mean it's good to look at those uh, if we get vacuoles in emphasize though they can be seen in several conditions we can still do a pes stain and that can further add to this case yes yes ma'am and uh, just a query about those 150 cases of dmd yes were they all uh, diagnosed here or are they cases which have been diagnosed elsewhere and and they are, they are, they, are, they, are they are and they are being diagnosed here only in our follow up they are this this much children are in our follow up they are diagnosed here and uh, the number which is being referred here is much more oh right right thank you so much A great presentation thank you so dr punam for dmc we have uh, we the patients are being coming here and they are diagnosed and because this require mlpa so now we have that uh, sequencer also we will shortly start the mlp but till now, we have a like tie up with the cdfd hyderabad right so uh, we are taking the samples only of this patient okay. and uh, the dna was sent there so they made the diagnosis wonderful thank you so much yeah. thank you sir thank you uh, good morning uh, dr lokesh yes ma'am yeah uh, dr samita here a uh, wonderful presentation by both you and dr devya uh and obviously a very rare case which has been taken at least to the diagnosis and i hope this patient is able to receive the treatment also at in due course of time uh, i would definitely endorse what dr kuldeep uh, told about uh, respiratory involvement in neuromuscular disorders it's yeah. something which is highly overlooked uh, and uh, is something that we should always uh, talk and find out from our patients whether they have uh, any kind of hyperventilation which may be initially only in the uh, sleep and then subsequently becomes more during in the daytime as well i just wanted to also know as to now how are you going to uh, counsel the parents and the patient since you talked about genetic counseling in this yes uh, disorder so ma'am ma uh, this particular patient the family has been completed they don't want another child already the one they have a one healthy child and one child is expired and this is the index child so that part at, at least we don't have to consult for this particular patient but uh, we have consulted regarding the prognosis regarding the treatment available and regarding the outcome which is based on literature what what literature says because such rare disorders we don't have much uh, personal data available with us but we can see into the literature that how is the natural course of the disease so that all been explained to the parents and we are hopeful that we will arrange the treatment for this child we have already giving enzyme therapy for one child and that child is uh, improving the child is improving so we hope that uh, this child should ha have uh, some Uh, stability in his kidney course because already cardiac involvement is there. We will take help of cardiology team also, and we will definitely take your suggestion, ma'am, and Kuldeep's suggestion that definitely pulmonary involvement is something which is um, which should not be overlooked, and we will be so we will be soon doing sleep uh, studies or at least we can we we do a sleep questionnaire in our OPDs for all such children that can be taken up as a part of. some study study also uh, yeah. it's a very good question that is genetic counseling so now we know that uh, this is a very highly prohibitive cost of the treatment so uh, that is very challenging but uh, beside this we can now we have the mutation known so we can have the extended family screening 
so any uh, a mother who is having a, going for opting for the pregnancy they can be consulted about going for this prenatal diagnostic testing and also the parental screening of both if they they are having a child so uh, that is and as soon as we get the center of excellence for rare disease uh, we can be linked to the crowd funding and other uh, offers from the ministry of health so that is another option we are looking for but till now it is very challenging it is because of the like uh, support from the genzyme as a uh, as a corporate responsibility they are giving but that is only for limited time so uh, some exploration for the long term care of this patient need to be looked and that has to be explained to the family thank you sir good morning uh, dr lokesh uh, wonderful presentation and uh, your colleague uh, from pathology did a wonderful job i have a curiosity from my side yes uh, in addition to uh, the replacement of enzyme does it uh, diet has any role in the management of this disease so diet uh, uh, as such has doesn't have any role in the pathology of the disease so there is no you, like but any neuromuscular disorder we always try to tell them that they should have a protein rich diet and they should take less of the fats as weight gain is it another a problem like added problem to them thank you so if there is no further any question or comment so uh, thanks all for attending this cpc online thank you all thank thank you sir